For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, these words not only serve to identify the ones who are cautioned against apostasy, but are added to emphasize the enormity of the sin. It would not be through ignorance or lack of knowledge, but after being enlightened, they abandon Christianity. The truth, rather than the gospel, is here specifically mentioned, so as to heighten the contrast. It is for a lie that Christ has rejected. The word knowledge here is a compound. It signifies acknowledgement and is so rendered in Titus 1 verse 1, Philemon verse 6. John Owen says, The word is not used anywhere to express the mere conceptions or notions of the mind about this, but such acknowledgement of it as arises from some sense of its power and excellency. To receive this acknowledgement of the truth includes an act of the mind in understanding it an act of the will in consenting, and an act of the heart in embracing it. Therefore, the sin here intended is plainly a relinquishment and renunciation of the truth of the gospel and the promises of it, with all duty thereunto belonging, after we have been convinced of its truth and avowed its power and excellency. There is no more required but that this be willingly not upon a sudden surprisal and temptation, as Peter denied Christ, nor in those compulsions and fears which may work a present dissimulation without an internal rejection of the gospel, not through darkness, ignorance making an impression for a season on the minds and reasonings of men, which things, though exceedingly evil and dangerous, may befall them who yet contract not the guilt of this crime. But it is required to this that men who thus sin do it by choice and of their own accord from the internal depravity of their own mind and an evil heart of unbelief to depart from the living God, that they do it by and with a preference of another way of religion and arresting in it before or above the gospel, end quote John Owen. The unpardonableness of the sin is affirmed in the words, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. A similar passage which throws light on our present verse is found in 1 Samuel 3 verse 14. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice or offering forever. As there were certain sins which in Old Testament times, from their heinousness and the high-handed rebellion of their perpetrators, had no sacrifice allowed them, but died without mercy, verse 29. So it is now with those who apostatize from Christ. There is no relief appointed for them, no means for their expiation of their sin. They voluntarily and finally reject the gospel, forfeit all interest in the sacrifice of Christ. Before leaving this verse, let it be said emphatically that there is nothing in it which in any wise conflicts with the blessed truths of the eternal security of God's saints. The apostle did not here say the Hebrews had apostatized, nor did he affirm that they would do so. No, instead he faithfully points out the sure, dreadful, and eternal consequence did they do so, for if we sin willingly, it was to keep them from it that he here sets it down by way of supposition, just as in Romans 8 verse 13 he says, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. As to how far a person may go in taking up Christianity, and as to what the Spirit may work in him, short of actual regeneration, and then that one apostatize, only God knows. And... As to how close a real Christian may come to presumptuous sinning, Psalm 19, verse 13, and yet remain in a sense of the great transgression only God can decide. We are only in the place of safety while we maintain the attitude of complete dependence upon the Lord and of unreserved subjection to Him. To indulge the flesh is dangerous. To persist in the course of self-gratification is highly dangerous and to remain in it to the end would be fatal.